I, hmm? Well, that it has mass is, okay. But, but in terms of it being related to having some material, it could be semantics again. I'm just tripping on this mm -hmm. semantic argument of this that was a great question. immateriality. Like if something mm -hmm. has mass or can generate momentum, mm -hmm. for example. As far as, okay, let me explain this. There's, this is a really good question. You're making me think of several things here. First of all, I'm saying that the Buddhist atoms are electrons and quarks and so forth. That is not proven. If we find a quark has a part, then that, what that means is, is that what we, the, the Buddhist, I mean, um, a Buddhist atomist like myself would just change their mind and say, well, nope. Uh, well, I mean, that may sound funny, but that's, of course, the virtue of scientific thought is that the pursuit is to change your mind, not to have stagnant, you know, thoughts through. Um, the whole idea is to overturn your own theory. Um, progress. Uh, so, okay, so that's one thing. A second thing is, though, is, as far as electron having mass, that, the, great, that's a great point. I know that intro physics students are told, you know, the electron has mass, it has a little radius. Virtually almost everything I've said here is contradicted in like your intro physics book. That's not my problem. That's the problem of the intro physics professors. They are not describing particles correctly. They're describing particles in a way that's not going to throw everybody into philosophic discussion so you can just train the engineers to know about the basics of physics. Um, so, but as far as an electron having mass, that, to me that question makes only so much sense. I mean, is mass just a kind of movement? Is mass just the interaction an electron has with the Higgs particle? Um, or is mass just some sort of property that is intrinsic to um, what an electron is? You know, if, if it's, uh, I, to be honest, I reject all three of those. And I say that the mass, it, and this is not, I'm not saying this because it's fun to give my opinion. This is something I've thoroughly argued elsewhere. What mass is, is our human way of constructing ideas about what um, structuralist Buddhist atoms are. So we see it, you know, through our computer or, or through Buddhist uh, meditation. And we describe it in certain ways with language, but language always misses the mark. As soon as you, like Zen masters often say, as soon as you say something, you're wrong. <laughs> uh, wow, well, it's very famous uh, Buddhist maxim. That would be the best way I could say here. That so, if you like, for example, if you said flashing piece of light, um, that's as close as we can get to a description. But ultimately, it's, uh, Buddhist atoms are ineffable beyond language, um, and that's uh, that's actually the focus of the article I mentioned earlier that I've got coming out later. All my work is summed up in one article. Uh, coming out, two, actually two, but really one article coming out later this year in Axiomath. It's called Muriological Nihilism. Uh, so I discussed that thoroughly. If there's something that is described in terms of language, it leads to contradiction. The only things that exist are those which are ineffable and only can be experienced through feeling, which is exactly what Buddhists have been saying for centuries. So, you know, it's, I mean, just to bring up well, what I think is a great example, why didn't, in Star Wars movies, of course, you know, Lucas was on to a lot of this kind of stuff when he made the Star Wars movies, why didn't he say, Lucas, I mean, you have all these quotes of um, Yoda saying, feel the force, um, Ben saying to uh, uh, Luke, feel the force. Why didn't they say, think about the force? Or, you know, talk about the force? Because it's only known through feeling. Um, and yeah. That, that feeling, uh, that is not, a, that is not an organ feeling. It's not through the eyes of touch. That is a, exactly. It's not through the mind either. It's not a brain activity. It's, it's not, not a nervous system activity. Nervous systems don't exist, according to Buddhist animism. None of this stuff, the, the reality you see is somehow or another, it's either completely, your senses are either completely wrong, or they're way off track in some way. Um, I'm not saying that you don't exist right there. That's not what I'm saying. It, but it very well could be the case but that that's in, true. In the flashing of unconnected, um, you know, flashes of energy, mm -hmm. unconnected. Uh, so how? So is that feeling cohesion? Yes. Okay. I'm actually going. That actually is the next topic here. Uh, let me give you a quote from the article I've mentioned now several times. I'm very excited about this article coming out. I might have worked on it since 1999. Uh, here's, here's basically what I say in uh, the aforementioned article. We've all been told that reality is coherent. That reality, the reality, the empirical reality, 
is explainable in terms of uh, coherent science, and if we find a problem, the problem's with us. Okay, I think there's even an X-Files quote, one of my favorite shows, uh, where Scully says to Mulder, she says, science is not in contradiction, it's humans' mistaken thoughts that are in contradiction about science. Um, Buddhist atomism says this, nothing could be further from the truth. That empirical reality, which we're calling Div 2, uh, all this uh, stuff up here, glad I drew this diagram, all this stuff up here, is describable by contradiction only and is all only given in terms of absurdity. So postmodernists are going to be very happy with Buddhist atomism. I've had postmodernists tell me that they are very fond of this theory. <laughs> so, so great. Um, but it's of course a scientific, uh, has a scientific basis for it, but I do like that postmodernists have jumped on the bandwagon a little bit. Only a few that have emailed me. Um, and this, re so division one is describable in terms of non-contradiction, if it's describable at all, because it's really technically ineffable. But if you try to construct a definition of it, very minimal definite description of it, it's going to be consistent. Now you should notice something. What I just said is a completely opposite of what is typically mentioned by scientists everywhere. What do scientists tell you about waves and particles, about uncertainties, and so forth? We are told by scientists everywhere that quantum reality involves paradox. Uh, Wave-particle duality. Who's heard of wave-particle duality? Okay, well good. <laughs> it's not like my classes where one person raises their hand. Uh, Wave-particle duality, I argue in, in the article coming out, is, doesn't exist. There is no wave. There is a movement in physics that's been generated by Loud, some loudmouth physicists, Feynman, a great example, Richard Feynman, he bitterly hated philosophers. If you die, just go read anything he's written, and it'll, you know, a couple sentences in, he'll start ripping on philosophers. Um, he's, he and others have been largely responsible for telling us, without argument, that all of a sudden, reality just has all these paradoxes, and they're irreducible, and we can't go into them, we can't explore them, and oh, by the way, Professor Feynman, when he was still alive, would tell us, or would, would demonstrate for us, if you question me on that, if you challenge my assertion, unargued for assertion, that this reality involves irreducible paradox, I'm going to laugh at you, mock you, and I'm going to use my platform as a famous physicist and announce to the whole world that you philosophers are idiots. Okay? Um, this is very mysterious for tons of reasons. Uh, one thing is, is that in all these other areas of science, that philosophy doesn't exist. The philosophy, which I just said is wrong, but the assumption is made that reality is coherent. So why all of a sudden here do a couple of physicists tell us that reality is incoherent? It's a political scandal, is what it is. The only reason we have the paradoxes of quantum reality, wave particle duality, stretched out smeared electrons through uncertainty, is due to metaphysics. Metaphysics is, you can define as non-scientific theorization about invisible things, things that are beyond our experience. When you have a metaphysics where you describe things beyond your experience, you can say anything you want. You can say, God is a man in the sky. I can't see him, and neither can you. I'll accept him through very special circumstances, but he's there. And if you don't believe me, I could cut off your hands or start war or something. Uh, of course, I'm referring to history. Uh, partially. Some things going on in Iraq make this... Uh, anyway, we'll get to that later. Uh, so this is very mysterious. If you, if you want more information about what I've just said about how the quantum paradoxes, the, the summary is the quantum paradoxes only derive through physicists, just a few, but actually a few famous ones, inserting metaphysics, non-scientific information, into their theories and just coming up with uh, these paradoxes. All physicists see are particles. But the only empirical thing that they get in their research looks like, oh, where's that film? Well, it's the one I showed you a little while ago, um, where the, you know, the lines were going like this. Uh, the idea that there are probability waves, probability clouds. Nobody's ever seen these. Yes, computers will generate a probability cloud, but that's through doing, uh, that's the computer's representation of generating particle activities.